Good morning. See, it's nice you're all here. <laughs> Thank you for being here, and uh, I will first uh, try to make an opening statement that gives you some perspective, I think, on the budget, and uh, then, of course, be available to deal uh, with questions. By tradition and by law, the release of the governor's budget, which I'm doing today, signals the starting point for a series of public debates. The press, the legislature, advocacy groups, and the general public have historically participated in those discussions and in that debate. And I think you can be guaranteed that those discussions will take place around this 1993-95 budget. However, unlike tradition, you could accurately characterize this budget as a series of important choices that build toward the investments needed for Oregon's future. To emphasize those choices, I have presented the budget in a format that clarifies the options. My mandated budget, the mandated plus choices, and the recommended budget. The choices are laid out clearly. When I began work on my budget proposals, I knew I had a real challenge on my hands. I wanted to demonstrate that we could build a budget that would allow us to live within our means, and you will see that in the mandated budget. I wanted to make certain we protected our most vulnerable citizens and moved others to self-sufficiency, and we met that commitment in the mandated plus budget. I wanted to improve Oregon's economy and our economic opportunities for all Oregonians, and we have moved toward those goals with investments in both our regular agency budgets and our new lottery budget. And I wanted to chart a course for Oregon's future that would help us as a state and a people to be the best we could be. And I know that the mandated and the mandated plus documents cannot provide that depth of investment. Short term, we can get by, but there is no long term foundation or stable funding for Oregon's educational system. My recommended budget, the option for overhauling Oregon's tax system, offers the legislature the opportunity to consider a tax reform plan and to focus almost all of the revenues from that plan toward education. I cannot be true to myself or to Oregon if I don't make clear that such reform is needed and important as we move toward the pending problems that we will find in the 95-97 budget period. But I want to be clear, I have no illusions. I don't believe the legislature is prepared to act now, and I don't believe that most Oregonians will be supportive until they believe that we are operating an efficient, cost-effective, results-oriented state government. So I will work with the legislature on my mandated and mandated plus budgets, giving them the clear choices and options that I have presented in those documents. And each of the decisions that I've made in the budget are designed against a backdrop of a changing Oregon. And to ignore that change is to ignore good budgeting. For instance, Oregon's population is changing in both numbers and composition. In the past 10 years, from 1981 to 1991, Oregon's population has grown by 269,000 people. Our population of age over 75 has increased 40% in 10 years. The number of children from age 5 to 9 has increased by 10%, while Oregonians living in poverty has increased over 25%, single-parent households have jumped 33%, and our prison population has skyrocketed in 10 years by 128%. Demands on schools, nursing homes, housing, prisons and jails, family services and government services are a growing pressure in this state. Oregon's economy is also changing. Some of our newer industries, such as high technology and medical technologies, foreign exports, and value-added manufacturing are placing new demands on our colleges and on our training resources in this state. Even our tax structure has made some changes. The elimination of the inventory tax and the unitary tax, reduction of the inventory tax in this state, and of course, the Measure 5 shift for the funding of schools from the local property taxes to the state general fund. But government is changing as well. Oregon's new education reform system will focus how we educate our students and basically re refocus the educational system. Our new workforce quality council system 
is committed to you gi giving us the best workforce in this nation, and we are moving toward that. The Oregon benchmarks that two years ago people really didn't pay much attention to are there to measure the progress of efforts to meet specific Oregon goals by the year 2000 and 2010. And because those are now used in the budgeting process, they're being used at both the state level and the local level, and they are making a difference. And I am committed to a results-oriented, accountable government. We are downsizing, we are consolidating, we are prioritizing, and we are focusing on results. So I just didn't look at this budget just in terms of whether a program was funded or whether an institution stayed open. I ask, would a program help reduce teen pregnancies? Would an investment in Head Start mean more successful students and increased graduates from our high schools? Would dollars focused on particular programs create more jobs, provide better rural health care, make communities more livable, or reduce the number of AIDS patients? That was the kind of questioning we asked throughout the budget. Whenever possible, this budget focuses on prevention, on long-term investments, on building strong foundations, on delivering results, and on maximizing resources. We rejected any temptation to present less than our best and most realistic options. This is true even with the mandated budget, which is constrained within the current estimated resources. The mandated budget does include some smaller fee increases, much smaller than the ones we brought to you two years ago, and also the general fund use of, for some very specific lottery dollars. But it also assumes the $1.5 billion responsibility for the first three years of Measure 5, no general salary increases for the first two, for the two years of this budget, and my commitment, which I have brought to you today, to present a budget with 4,000 fewer positions. So what I want to do for a few minutes is to focus on some specific choices that you will find in this budget. And I'd like first to highlight three of the major areas of the budget that will be very clear that they are the large areas and then take a couple of minutes to talk about another area. During the conversation with Oregon and in my constant contact with Oregon Oregonians, it remains clear that the safety of Oregon families and their homes and their communities ranks as a very high priority with our citizens. Public safety is a core responsibility of state government. This budget assumes that responsibility and has made choices that reflect that commitment. We began with needed efficiencies. We made major cuts in administrative positions that freed dollars for state police officers and critical cor corrections programs. There are some reductions. The military department, for instance, will close 10 of its 42 Oregon armories. The state police will also close facilities one of their seven crime labs, seven of their 19 outposts, five of their 25 patrol offices, and the Portland Dispatch Center. The Corrections Department faces tighter budgets, and there will be 602 fewer prison beds at the end of this budget process. The budget will close the Mill Creek Corrections Facility in Salem and the Intake Center in Oregon City. But those choices have allowed us to prioritize dollars to reduce recidivism in our prison population. Prisons need not be recycling centers. We are prepared to invest in serious drug and alcohol treatment behind bars and as part of the release back to the community. We will focus on inmate literacy, on education, and on job skills. We will prepare inmates to return to the community with more work and more housing transitions and more successful, less expensive community services. New programs such as electronic monitoring will help supervise some of the 30,000 people currently on parole or probation. We will also introduce another program in our battle against recidivism, the intensive boot camp program for the first time to be used in Oregon that will deal with first time younger prison commitments. We know from New York and California and other places that it's cost effective and successful and we will use it here in Oregon. I will also strengthen the State Police Department's investigation unit for child protection. This public safety budget emphasizes efficiencies, consolidations, 
and new directions and innovations. We will keep Oregonians safe, diminish recidivism in the prison system, and maximize the results of the services we provide to that population. Another high priority in this budget is education. At every level of education, we focused on results, on reform, on research, and on tomorrow's workforce. We sought efficiencies, consolidation of programs, increased cooperation between institutions and between levels of education, and where possible, access and affordability to post-high school education services. Higher education will cut its administration by more than 20 percent and increase faculty productivity by 15 percent. Tuitions will be increased at the higher education institutions by 7 percent per year instead of the proposed 15 percent annually. And enrollments will drop 7 percent. Actually, that results in about a loss of 4,400 students in the higher education system. But we have invested in a tuition waiver program and we have concentrated scholarships on need in order to include low and middle income students under these new criteria. There will also, of course, be tuition increases at Oregon's 16 community colleges. So higher education students at every level will be paying higher tuitions. We have proposed closure of the veterinary school at Oregon State University. The Department of Education will provide reduced levels of services to Oregon's local school districts. But we have avoided any closure of any of the eight higher education institution campuses in an effort to protect what I would describe as higher education infrastructure as we look at the predicted growth in those institutions over the next decade. Once you close an institution, it is very, very difficult to reopen that institution. But the bigger decisions about education are in the level of support to the three major segments of Oregon's educational system. In the mandated and the mandated plus budget, higher education is funded at 86 percent. The community colleges, which are funded with a combination of student tuition, state general funds, and local property taxes, will end up with almost 90 percent of their current program levels funded when all of those sources are added together. And the final area of this education budget is the K-12 through education system. The state school fund is the largest single item in the general fund budget. And attempting to fund that school program level at current service levels became impossible without literally devastating the rest of the state budget. In the mandated budget, the state will provide $2.6 billion to the state school fund. Combined with local property taxes, this will fund schools at 90 0.4% of current program levels. Now, obviously, the impact will be felt by school districts all across Oregon, but with a $1.2 billion loss in the state budget, no area could be held harmless, and that included education. Yet, in spite of the limited dollars in the education budget, we restored Head Start to current levels and fully funded the current level for early intervention. You will see in a few minutes an additional piece of education, and it is my belief that education at every level is vital to Oregon's economic future. And when I highlight the lottery budget investments, you will see that we have directed dollars in some cases into all three segments of education. You're also going to see other monies committed to children that will help them stay ready to learn. And I don't mean just ready to learn as they enter the first grade or kindergarten. I mean ready to learn from birth to graduate school. The human resources area is another one of the areas, obviously, the three largest in the budget. And as we look at the mandated budget for Human Resources Agency, you will see it defined less by what is funded than by what is not. In making the difficult choices in the human resources budget, we set four goals. To protect services for the most vulnerable of Oregon's populations, to continue services to encourage self-sufficiency, to stress prevention services, and to maximize federal dollars wherever possible. But despite all of those priorities, many critical services would be negatively affected under the mandated budget. 
And at a time when demands on our human services programs are under daily growth, those cuts would obviously be negative and in a sense doubly negative by both population and cut. So we have worked to free up dollars in the human resources budgets and other places. For instance, we cut administration, automated to create better efficiencies, and we consolidated agencies and moved more programs to the community where they are less costly and in many cases more successful. But it finally comes down to what I believe are unacceptable cuts to our disabled citizens, to the mentally ill, to senior citizens, and to our most needed ch needy children and families. Under the mandated budget, we cannot protect many vulnerable Oregonians. We must walk away from program levels that encourage self-sufficiency and programs that invest in prevention, like prenatal care and teen clinics and alcohol and drug prevention. Those are the places that we cannot fund the critical programs in the mandated budget. This belief that the human services cuts are unacceptable has resulted in the mandated plus options you see in the budget. I have proposed that the legislature increase our beer and wine tax by five cents per drink and dedicate those revenues to combating the growing problems caused by alcohol and drug abuse. Most of the dollars will be focused on children and on youth. This will be the first increase since 1977 in the beer and wine tax and will make Oregon's beer, for instance, number three nationally, but it will raise $77 million to aid in those critical population shortfalls. The cigarette tax increase I am proposing will be 10 cents per pack and will help pay for tobacco and other health-related programs within the human resources area. We have not increased our cigarette tax in Oregon since 1989. It will raise $44 million and place Oregon's cigarette tax at number seven nationally. But without those two health tax increases, I believe we've left too many Oregonians without a safety net and without any hope for a better life. But even looking at the shortcomings, if you will, in the human resources mandated budget, we have seized on every opportunity to improve services with a special emphasis on children and youth. This agency will increase its family unity services to help keep families intact. There is an expansion of services to both HIV and AIDS for counseling, testing, community education, and AIDS prevention. We have also targeted teens who are not in school in terms of that particular area of concern. There will be eight new school-based health clinics and they will help bring health care and health care education to teenagers who desperately need it in this state. This budget will also help 2,100 young people with disabilities to move from school to work in a transition program that will help make them successful and keep them self-sufficient. Children, families, and self-sufficiency have been given high priority in both the mandated and the mandated plus budget. I believe, really, that readiness to learn, which we often describe to mean young children, is not just for kindergarten and the first grade, that it is for every year and every grade. So when we have focused dollars on children, we have helped keep them in school, whether it's drug and alcohol treatment, whether it's teen clinics, and whether it's programs that deal with child abuse and protection. Now, I mentioned a final area of the budget that I wanted to talk about for just a few minutes, and this is one that I think should receive some focus because it is different than it has been before, and that is the 1993-95 lottery budget. Now, as you know, under the Oregon Constitution, all proceeds must be dedicated to economic development. Because of the video lottery, the, the lottery revenue as a whole has increased to almost $300 million in this biennium. It is the largest budget in this short history of the lottery here in Oregon. Now, it might have been a great temptation to simply grab the pot of money, call almost anything you can imagine economic development, and fill some small part of the gap in the budget. However, I feel very strongly that is not the purpose of the lottery, and without some real focus, we will show no positive long-term results from the lottery expenditures we make in this new budget. So I have divided the budget for the lottery into three categories. One is to invest in people, one is to invest in communities, and the final one, to invest in business. In order to be included in the lottery budget, 
any program or plan for expenditure had to fit clearly into those targeted frameworks. Let me describe the highlights within each of those three categories to give you an idea of the kind of investments we have proposed in the lottery budget. If you go into the community investment category, include some familiar programs you all know, like the regional strategies program and the rural development efforts that we've had there before. But it now expands to $7 million for rural community facility development and $5 million in new affordable housing in those communities. The other important part of the public infrastructure includes $22 million to help communities in this state comply with the new federal requirements for drinking water and wastewater treatment. This is going to be particularly important in smaller communities and rural areas where they must meet that federal demand and really don't have the resources to do it. The other community investment commit, uh, commitments, and there are two I want to talk about briefly, include more than $4 million to help communities identify and prepare developable lands for community growth and business expansion. So they can identify them, find them, get them ready, and then they'll be ready to uh, really reach out to businesses in terms of growth in their community. There is a strong focus on new transportation options as well. There is $20 million in this budget which will fulfill our biennial commitment to the West Side Light Rail in Washington County, which is the portion that comes out of the lottery budget. Plus, there are two planning investments for continuing our future transportation growth. There is a $4 million commitment to moving uh, planning forward on light rail in Clackamas County. That means instead of waiting till we get the Washington County facility done, we can begin the planning now so we stand ready to reach out to any federal match dollars and move forward to that next segment of light rail. There is also a million dollars in this budget to support planning for the Vancouver to Eugene high speed rail. So we're moving forward on the planning knowing that those transportation options are critical to our future. The lottery segment that deals with investing in business and creating Oregon jobs continues our commitment to the Special Works Fund, the Ports Funding, Tourism, Film and Video, International Trade, and Business Development, the traditional places we have funded in that budget. But there are some strong new investments in higher education that literally focus on business support and business success, on industry research, and customizing training for specific businesses. These include, for example, the support for the Graduate School of Engineering, the Joint Business School program that will be used with several institutions all over the state, the Integrated Forest Research Program, and the research regarding food processing that dramatically affects our agricultural industry and their growth in the state. What we have done is make higher education and business partners in those programs. Finally, the category in the lottery called investing in people. It has been expanded to focus our commitment to help Oregonians become the best educated and best prepared workforce in America by the year 2000. This area of the budget includes several components to help fund Oregon's new Education Reform Act. It includes faculty development, development of student assessment tools, youth apprenticeship programs, and school to work transitions for disabled high school students. What these investments do in the school reform area is to make certain we don't lose that school reform movement in this tight budget. So it helps us keep that school reform movement and its work on track and on time. This segment of the budget also includes my strong commitment to a broad workforce preparation and training arena by adding $17 million to the community colleges professional and technical programs. This not only enhances that work that they do with businesses, but it also links it to the portion of the community colleges that are linked to the education reform program. There is $30 million in regional workforce funding. Much as we did the regional strategies, the work from the Workforce Council has now moved us to regional workforce funding to help with training and preparation for workers all over the state. There is $6 million for tr training dislocated workers, and there is $37 million for the jobs program for training that will move women from welfare to the workplace. So this is a very broad-based look at workforce preparation, moving our citizens to be trained and ready to work in Oregon's economy. This is a lottery budget that is committed to results and dedicated to economic health and economic infrastructure for the state of Oregon. 
As you look at this budget as a whole, it sets clear priorities for Oregon, and it reflects my values and I believe those of Oregonians. We have worked to make government more efficient and effective, to save money not only in programs that I have discussed, but in every agency that is part of state government. I have focused on the central missions of state government, to protect our people and the safety of our communities, to help the most vulnerable Oregonians to build self-sufficiency and to give them a safety net, and to educate our people and build a workforce equal to any in this nation. And this budget also invests, as you can see, in Oregon's economic development and in communities and people and businesses that will make that economy strong. But overall, in spite of all the good things, this is a stark budget that reduces many services that government now provides. I believe it is a realistic budget, and it is the best budget I could deliver under our current revenues. I look forward to working with Oregonians and with the legislature as we make these critical choices for the future of the state of Oregon. I will be happy to take your questions. Governor, to what extent can you convince the skeptics both in the legislature and in the public that uh, government is efficient enough so that uh, they will consider a mandated plus or a recommended budget level? Well, I think as people work closely with the budgets, it's going to be very clear. If you have 4,000 less positions, if you cut the administrative levels across every area of government from higher education to local agencies and in state government, if you've done all of those efficiencies and we can demonstrate them, if you can see the efficiencies that are listed here, some of the kinds of savings that have been made by what we have done, I think the numbers are so clear that you can see the, what we have been able to accomplish there. If you look at this two-year um, uh, commitment to leave uh, state uh, general salaries at the place where they are now, and if you keep looking through the level of how we have done things in this budget, I think it would be very difficult not to believe that we have done the efficiencies and we have made the commitment to a better government. And it is a smarter government in terms of how we're operating and the choices we've made. I don't know that I can convince everyone of that, but I think it will not take long for people to understand we have done government differently than it has been done in the past. And the year and a half work that we have done with the task force and the prioritizations and the 4,000 position cuts, each of those things have moved us toward being able to deliver a budget that I believe has more efficiencies, less personnel, and more uh, really uh, accountable results than any budget in the past. It seems like you've thrown in the recommended budget for good measure mainly. Uh, is it fair for me to assume that, that uh, you have no real uh, expectation that, that it's going to be approved? Is that well, I, I think we need to be realistic about this, and that's what I've tried to do. That is the reason we work so hard in the mandated in the mandated plus budget to make them the best we could make them, and to believe that we might live with them. Well, rate, rate the chance of the recommended budget, though. What, what, what's your uh, outlook on that? As far as well, there. It is unlikely, in my estimation, that the legislature would act early on anything that had to do with major tax reform. Whether they will be willing to look at that later as it becomes clear what these cuts mean and what these changes mean in state government as people have to face the actual cuts that everyone's been discussing in generality for a long time, I think that remains to be seen. I am hopeful that eventually that's where the legislature will go, but my first priority is to get the mandated budget at the lottery budget and the mandated plus budget through this legislative system. And I think the only way the legislature will move a plan from this legislature to the public is when the public understands the changes we've made in government, when the legislature recognizes it, and when the public begins to demand some kind of change for the future. Yeah, there's, a, there's really nothing you could do to put more heat on legislators than cut school support by 20%. We didn't, we didn't cut school support by 20 percent. Well, well, the problem the problem with that issue, and I want to put it in perspective again, we don't have anything that's just called basic school support anymore. Because basic school support and the Measure 5 commitment to education has become such a huge part of the budget, it's like comparing apples and oranges. So the only way you can really compare what schools got from the last budget to this one is to look at all of the resources, property taxes included with all of the state support. So it's really about a 10% cut and not a 20% cut. State funding. 
that comes out of the state the state's fund for the schools is, is about 20 percent. No, because you can't ignore the Measure 5 state funding for schools. It is money directly transferred from our state budget to schools. Ju I mean, it's, it's equivalent to the property taxes they used to have that are now state general fund dollars. So, so to try to believe that all we've done is basic school support and not add the two funds together, which are all commitments to education, I think is to be unrealistic in the comparison. Local school districts in the state of Oregon will be working with about 10 percent less resources in total than they were working over this two-year budget. Okay, we'll give whatever percentage you want to sell on. Well, how would you respond to the thought that this might be attempting to force legislators hand to tax reform by, by taking it out of the area where they're going to feel the most heat? There is no intent in this budget to create pain or to create what is the so-called Washington Monument strategy, to hold something out there that, that I believe has to be funded in hopes that it will be funded. Because if you do that in this budget, if you one little percentage point of basic school support is millions and mil tens of millions of dollars. So if you do that, you must then take money out of corrections, out of state police, out of human resources programs, out of higher education. So there is no attempt to use this budget as a tool to get tax reform in, by setting something out as a pain strategy, and that includes education. If you compare education with other programs in the budget, you will see that the, that the cuts are similar. Uh, for community colleges, higher education took a higher uh, loss in some respects than, than did local education. Many programs in state government were cut by a greater percentage than that. So there's no attempt to make education a scapegoat or a strategy for pain in this budget. Governor, could you talk about the gross receipts tax imposed on health service providers? The gross receipts uh, medical tax is our attempt to find a way to fund the Oregon Health Plan. We worked very hard to fund it in completion in the budget. It was not possible to do that. We believe it is vital for Oregon citizens, for the thousands of people who have no health insurance. We believe it's important for the medical community who are, in a sense, eating lots of the cost of uninsured citizens doctors and dentists and hospitals who are taking patients in but are really not receiving any payment. We believe we will add support to that medical community. So by that token, we have asked the medical community to help us fund this important project, which they support, and to do as we have done with other areas of the budget, to say help us to fund the most important things. All of us are giving something, and this is a place I think we can make a difference for patients, for the medical community as a whole, and for funding Oregon's health plan. I would be hopeful as time went on and we have uh, repaired some of the difficulties we have that have been created by Measure 5 that the need to do that might be short term rather than long term. Well, then just pass that on to the patients? Depends on how they handle it. I mean, there's no way to guarantee how that will be handled, but we do that in a sense with everything we do. Uh, I mean, anytime you tax something, it gets, it gets shifted. And we have tried to be very cautious about the kind of fee increases we brought forward, about other kinds of taxes that affected negatively uh, communities. But nothing affects the medical community and its patients so much as to have thousands of Oregonians, about 120,000, who have no health insurance. That affects everything in Oregon. All of us, when we buy health insurance, pay more because we are paying part of that cost as well. We pay more for hospital services and medical services. So in the end, this, I believe, will move us toward a more balanced uh, funding structure to, to pick up that cost now and with the hopes that we might find a different way to do it long term. How, aggressive, how aggressively are you going to move ahead on tax reform? My priorities are going to be to get the mandated and the mandated plus budget out. I think it is very clear that it would not be productive or realistic to move now on tax reform in the recommended budget. I don't think the legislature is ready. I don't believe the public is ready. You, My being I, ready doesn't solve the problem. Do you, a, do you see a point in this session where you would shift and start pushing for tax reform? That, that shift will come when the legislature shifts. We have to have the support of the legislature to move the recommended reform funding mechanism to the ballot. And without their support, it is not going to go anywhere. So I think as they deal with this budget, I think they will come face to face with not only the realities of this budget for 93-95, but it will begin to be clear what this budget will look like in 95-97. 
I believe that is the piece of the information that is probably as significant as any. Can we get by for two years without it? I think we could. We may have to. Can we get by through 95, 97 without it? I don't believe it's possible. So the question is whether you sort of bite the bullet and do the job in this legislative session or a special session that might follow it, or the, whether you wait and face that in 95, 97. Governor, uh, on the provider tax, uh, what better chance would it have now than I believe you proposed had a similar proposal uh, in the 91 session, which the legislature took no action on? Well, basically in the last session, you had some flexibility within the budget to commit large dollars to the Oregon Health Plan. I supported that. Uh, I was actively involved in, in helping that happen. We've worked to try to get the waiver so we could use that money to begin funding uh, the Oregon Health Plan. There are not those areas of flexibility in this budget. I mean, you cannot fund the kinds of things we must fund in corrections and human resources and education and still fund this mechanism within that, not because it's not a priority. If it weren't a priority, I would not have the provider tax in the budget. It's a high priority for me and I think for the state and I believe for patients in the medical community. So. Last time, there just simply wasn't the pressure that we have this time. There were other alternatives that I don't believe exist in this budget. You said that you could get through this next biennium without a new tax plan. It wouldn't be possible after that, but you could get through uh, this biennium. I said we uh, not only could we, but we may have to. And I'm not saying it will be pleasant, and I'm not saying it will be easy, but I'm saying with the mandated plus options, with the investments we made in the lottery, we have a budget put together that will allow us with very restrictive use of personnel, of dollars, of programs and efficiencies to get through, to get by, if you will, this next two year period. But it is, it really, in a sense, walks away from our commitment to education long term and it walks away from the reality that Measure 5 is still coming at us and at some point in time we have to face that reality. So the choice is whether the legislature chooses to face it in this budget or whether they choose to face it in the 95-97 budget. Didn't your con in your conversation and that sort of thing say that it was impossible to get through in this by any with the tax It is impossible to serve Oregonians in a way that I feel comfortable about. It is impossible to fund education in the way that I believe we should. It is impossible to do the best job we can do with moving forward moving Oregon forward without the reform. That doesn't mean we can't do it. We can be less than we have been, and that is true with this budget, but it's necessary to do that, and if we must, we will. I think you could look at it like a business. If you looked at a high technology business, you know if you don't continue to invest that you fall off and somebody else becomes the leader. You have less than quality and you're less than competitive. Oregon can put itself in that category in the next two years to not do quite as good a job as we have done and serve quite as many people and invest quite as much in the future as we need to do. But if you do that long term, eventually the state will be diminished. That's the thing I've said from the beginning. It is still true now. If I didn't believe it was true, I would not have the recommended budget before you. We have time for two more questions. Governor, two years ago you said that uh, people's lives would literally be put in danger by the budget you were presenting then. I don't think that anybody died as a result of that budget, and you're certainly not saying that now. What's changed? Well, I, I think clearly we have had some fortunate things happen. The lottery budget increased. There have been some positive economic changes. We brought efficiencies into government that allowed us to do more with the dollars we've had. But I think we don't know what the impact was of the people, the senior citizens that we took services away from. We don't know what the impact was of some of the disability programs where we took dollars away last time. Once we make those decisions, we sort of walk away from the human element that's part of it. We get letters in my office that tell me it's made a dramatic difference in the lives of some families in a, in a negative way. But because the programs are gone, we've sort of quit focusing on them. I think this is the case again. We've done the best job we can, be, we can do. We've covered the most vulnerable populations as much as we can. We've built the safety nets. We've really tried to do the kind of work of focusing our dollars. But, you know, there will be people who are in a community where their state police office is going to be closed who will believe that they are more vulnerable than they were before. There are people who are in programs that will not be funded in this budget who will feel that same loss. And I think it's unrealistic to think that some of those won't have very negative impacts on families and on individuals in Oregon. But 
the truth is it doesn't do any good for me to be the only person who in the government who believes this process needs to move forward. I will continue to tell people that I think it's critical, that I think it's important, that I think we should do it, that I think it will keep Oregon healthy, and that we can be a kind of state that we want to be and that we have been in the past. But that doesn't mean that you can move the legislature there until they've made the same kind of hard choice as I have. And I think I would say to you, we have generalized about cuts for two years. Now we have specifics. We know what these kinds of cuts look like because we have a document that shows us what they look like. Before this, it has been generalization. Now it is specifics. And obviously, as the governor proposes this, the legislature will now dispose in some way with uh, pieces of it. But every time you move a piece of this budget, you affect something else that may be very costly. Just one follow-up. You were originally against video poker. Now that you have the money to spend, have you changed your mind? No, I don't, think, I don't think gambling is a good way for government to raise money. But as long as those resources are part of this budget, I'm going to use them in the most effective way I can. Okay, Governor, thank you. Um, the budgets are available in the back. The hand up, members of the media. Thank, thank you. you very much.